you know, seeing him really help, I would say, liberate people and turn them on to a way of thinking and a way of believing that I grew up in. Yes. So I, in a sense, saw him extending a hand, um, but also building a bridge, you know, for people to make that journey in consciousness from poverty to prosperity, from mm -hmm. lack and limitation to abundance um, and success and just in fulfilling lives. Yeah. And so that aspect was really amazing to witness, you know. Peace and riches, blessings. I am Michael B. Beck with the host of Take Back Your Mind. Peace and radical blessings to all of you, and thank you for tuning in to Take Back Your Mind, the podcast that is about having dominion over our attention, so we're not easily caught up in the swell of fear, doubt, and worry, and negativity, the downward spiral of anxiousness, and that which leads to bad choices, bad decision-making. We're going to take back our mind through spiritual practice, intention-setting, spiritual technologies. That's why every week I have a different guest or guest and we dialogue about possibility. We dialogue about potential. We dialogue about their life and how they transcended whatever obstacles they were living in at any given time in human history. So welcome to Take Back Your Mind. I am your host, Michael B. Beckwith. We have a life question of the week. It's from um, Jay from the UK. He was trying to get me to rhyme at this space and time. Jay from the UK. He says, how can I learn to truly trust myself? I have set so many intentions. I have prayed. I've been a long time meditator. And I feel that I have followed the universe's guidance. I have made decisions that have turned out bad for me, including marrying someone that I now realize I'm critically incompatible with. In addition, my health isn't what it used to be. My savings are gone, and my sense of self-love and self-trust are non-existent. I've been trying to proactively figure things out for myself, but feel completely lost. Do you have any insight for me? Jay from UK, you have been trying to proactively figure things out. That is not the way. That is not the way to expand your awareness into a sense of self-love and appreciation ultimate health and prosperity. It's not about the figuring out mind. It's about tapping into the divine mind and being able to allow that to guide, direct, inspire you in the right choices and right decisions. So how do you do that? You think about someone in your life, anyone, past or present, on this side of the veil or the other, grandmother, an auntie, an uncle, a friend, but an individual that you feel when they think about you, there's, a, there's love there, there's appreciation. Regardless of what you may be growing through in your life, you find someone in your life that's got your vibrational back. Oftentimes, this is a grandparent who has less judgment than the parents because the parents have a, have a, have a kind of a parental fantasy as to how they want you to turn out. But oftentimes the grandparents or the great grandparents, they just love more easily. They have a, a, a kind of an unconditional love. I want you to think about anyone in your life that when you think about them, that feeling emerges. And then you close your eyes and you feel how they love you unconditionally. As you're feeling how they love you, you begin to embrace that feeling tone of love. It's easier because it's coming from someone else. It's not you trying to figure it out or you time trying to generate it. You're actually borrowing the consciousness of someone who loves you. You sit with that in meditation, 
contemplation. You feel the feeling of what it feels like to be loved. And then, as you're feeling what it feels like to be loved, you let go of the individual that's loving you, the grandparent, the friend, the auntie, the uncle, whatever it is. You let go of them for a moment, but you just feel the love. And you breathe into the love, and you give yourself permission to embrace yourself from that kind of love. So it grows into a self-love and appreciation. Now here are the ramifications of that. When you allow yourself to feel the love and then to embrace it as self-love and appreciation, the static on the line will begin to be dissolved. In other words, we're always, the Spirit of God is always broadcasting love and peace, beauty and intelligence. But there's, there could be static on the line. Lack of self-love, fear, doubt, worry. I'm not good enough. I made too many mistakes. That's static. So you borrow somebody else's consciousness. You feel the love. You sit in it. And then you say from the, that vibration of love, what is the next step that I am to take to manifest health, prosperity, and joy. But notice, you're not trying to figure anything out, nor are you hanging into the frequency of a lack of self-love trying to manifest. You're borrowing the love of someone, and you're asking the questions from that love. Then in a language and in a way that you can understand, Guidance and wisdom and direction will follow. Try that as a dynamic spiritual technology and do it on a regular basis. Before you go to sleep at night, when you wake up in the morning, when your mind is fresh and not caught up in the world, your subconscious mind will begin to take that in and it will become your new law. Thank you for asking the question. I'm sure you helped a number of people with that question. Peace and blessings. Peace and blessings, everybody, and welcome back to Take Back Your Mind, a place where we are truly taking back our mind from the worry, the doubt, the fear, the anxiousness, the anxiety, the, the deep sense of separation from the presence that's never an absence. Every week I have individuals on this program that in their own way are in the world doing mighty and magnificent things, assisting people to take back their mind. So the mind is not just a set of programs of anxiety, but it's a whole new intentionality of becoming more and never less than your true self. I have two individuals with me today, and this is, this is double our fun. I have Mark Victor Hansen best known as the co-author of the Chicken Soup of the Soul book series and brand, setting world records in book sales, achieving number one New York Times bestseller 59 times with over 500 million books sold and becoming the Time Magazine publishing phenomena of the decade. Mark is a prolific writer who has also co-authored other popular books, such as The Power of Focus, the Aladdin Factor, Dare to Win, One Minute Millionaire, and his latest co-author with his wife, Crystal Dyer Hansen, simply ask the bridge from your dreams to your destiny. Now, Mark and I have known each other for years. When he was living close, he was a regular attendee of Agape International Spiritual Center. So we go back decades, actually. Indeed. Xavier. Yes. Mm -hmm. Say that last name for me again. I don't want to mess it up. Icarin Coulter. Icarin Coulter. There you go. Musician, spoken word artist, who served as a spiritual minister for over 40 years and worked alongside his father, you know, Reverend Ike. Beautiful rebel of the spirit that transformed lives. After Reverend Ike's uh, transition in 2009, Xavier served as a spiritual leader at the United Palace, formerly known as the United Palace Cathedral in New York City. He founded two nonprofit organizations, the United Palace of Cultural Arts, 
in New York and the Rhythm Arts Alliance in Los Angeles, which works with gang-affiliated youth and teaches transformation through mentorship and ancestral practices like very necessary rites of passage and West African drumming, of which he is a master at that particular art form. Mark and Xavier have recently co-written a new book together, Reverend Ike, An Extraordinary Life of Influence. Actually, and it comes out this December. And you can pre-order yours now on Amazon. You, you want to pre-order. You want to just go ahead and get in the, in the, in the, in the vibration of that. And what, what inspired you guys to come together and actually write this book, this powerful life of influence at this particular time? What happened is, as you know, Michael, I was in New York and, and uh, I'd been with Buckminster Fuller, Einstein's best student, built geodesic domes, lost $2 million in one day, <laughs> was inspired to go see Reverend Ike at three to five o'clock one Sunday afternoon and was blown away in Washington Heights. And what he did is he got me to have a new model for living and a new model for my future when I wanted to commit suicide mm. and was crashed. And what happened is he inspired and influenced me and then I was an ambitious kid, so I got to inspire others with all this stuff and, and got addicted to right thinking, right living, and being all I could be, doing all I could do, and having all I could have. And now, as you just said, we've done over $2 billion worth of books and retail and over a billion dollars worth of licensing. I've written 320 uh, or co-authored or authored bestsellers with a lot of famous people. And what he did is he woke up my creative center inside, and mm -hmm. I was and I, his son, and I have gotten together to do the book that we think will be his legacy into the future, because everyone who's read it goes, wow, this is life expanding, life changing, life improving. And it takes you from poverty to prosperity and sickness to health. That's that's beautiful. I mean, I, uh, uh, we we know how you came to know Reverend Ike, because <laughs> that's your dad. What was, what was it like growing up, uh, watching your dad basically... Uh, challenging the status quo of religiosity mm -hmm. and having people break out of that paradigm. Yes, it was an interesting upbringing with mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, seeing him really help, I would say, liberate people and turn them on to a way of thinking and a way of believing that I grew up in. Yes. So, I, in a sense, saw him extending a hand, um, but also building a bridge, you know, for people to make that journey in consciousness from poverty to prosperity, from mm -hmm. lack and limitation to abundance um, and success and just in fulfilling lives. Yeah. And so that aspect was really amazing to witness, you know, of course, at church every week, sitting there watching my dad do his thing. Um, and being inspired by him as well. You know, he was one of my, one of my early teachers. I would play his tapes at night listen mm. to him as I went to bed. And so his approach is foundational, you know, to my personal, uh, spiritual approach. So, um, it was wonderful. Um, and then of course, when he passed, it was clear that, you know, I have to tell the story absolutely have to tell the story. So I worked on it for a long, long time and came to a personal impasse with it. And that's when I reached out to Mark and said, Mark, let's, uh, let's do this because we need to get this out there uh, to the world. And uh, thank goodness, you know, we were able to get together and complete the volume and um, it's ready for the world. Beautiful. I, I, I noticed now that a lot of uh, uh, your dad's teachings are now on social media mm. you know, they pop up and they're and they and they could they fit right now you know it's not like an, an, an ancient something that happened years ago when you hear him speak and the fire uh coming through him and the teaching that's coming through him it's present moment it's it's uh it's you know because principles don't have a a shelf life you know principles of truth are forever and um and so we can actually see that now Either one of you can talk about this too. It's like obviously, and you know this, he grew up in abject poverty, you know, in terms of his environment growing up. Uh, but yet he overcame all of that to lead millions of people into success and health and well being. So speak to that a, a moment. Either one of you can talk about that. But I want people to understand he didn't just, he didn't grow up with a silver spoon in his mouth because oftentimes people will use excuses like, you know, 
I came from a bad side of the tracks. I didn't have any money. I was in foster care, whatever the case may be. But uh, he had challenging upbringing. Absolutely. Being all that, born in 1935 in the 40s, being in South Carolina, and then all of a sudden he decides sort of and then is inspired by his grandmother to become a man of cloth. And by 14, he's doing it and he's outrageously outrageous, such that he brought everybody down to the water and <laughs> a big band and they got flipped out. And then, you know, when he lost his privilege to go to uh, what he called theological seminary, but he called it a cemetery. Right. Uh, you know, they, they were not that keen on him because he was doing innovative thinking. He said, hey, wait a second, you guys are saying poverty is a good thing. And I teach the best thing you can do for the poor is not be one of them. And <laughs> he took it and manifested 26 Rolls Royces. So he was a sermon that was better to watch even than listen to and read, although he was phenomenal. He just he woke up my spiritual spark plug by making the complex, simple, easy to understand to anyone, even in street language. So he inspired not only me, but he inspired millions to get out of lack limitation, as Xavier articulately said. But the other thing he did, Michael, that was so beyond brilliant, is he was a supernatural healer. He could get rid of people's tuberculosis, cancer, alcoholism, drug abuse on mm -hmm. the spot. It, mm -hmm. and I just watched that, and I watched him break canes, and I was there to get prosperity because I'd already lost $2 million and wanted to kill myself. So I thought, this is like way cool, but I'll let Xavier go into the family because obviously he is the family. Yeah, I, I, I did see when I was at the palace, like canes and wheelchairs on the wall where people had uh, got up and didn't need them anymore. And uh, it, it was amazing to just see all that stuff, uh, you know, like history of, of, of healing. So exactly what you're saying, Mark, he not only was speaking about breaking free from limited thinking, scarcity and lack and moving to abundance, but healing was a part of his, 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 his gift. Absolutely. And um, yes, see, the key thing in my father's message, his absolute foundational principle mm -hmm. is that we as human beings are creations of God. Yeah. And to use the old language, if I'm a child of God, that makes me child of the king. And therefore, I am 100 percent worthy of all of the good that God has and everything that the universe could have for me, I deserve mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. manifest that. Mm -hmm. So through the power of his identifying as a true son of God, the way Jesus Christ did, he learned that from Christ. Yeah, yeah right. By assuming that consciousness that I and my father, I and my source are one. Right. He was able to harness that power and then develop himself personally, his imagination, his ability to communicate, and his ability to conduct healings, which is centered in the knowing, I and my father are one. Mm -hmm. Once we're aligned with that, mm -hmm. person who needs healing comes into the presence. Mm -hmm. They align. So it's activating the power within the person who is willing to touch the hem of the garment, aligning, helping that person align. So it's not really that my dad healed. My dad created and allowed a resonance for people to come in so that they could raise their vibrational frequency and the sickness could, could fall away. There are stories of people coming in wheelchairs, walking out of the place. And I've seen this personally. I'm sitting there watching people get up out of wheelchairs. My dad would take canes and break them over his leg. <laughs> People re wheeled in on uh, pallets, you know, hospital yeah. beds. Yeah. Getting up, walking out. Yeah. So the power of God, the power of source, universal mind, whatever you want to call the ultimate presence, it's real. And it's now. And it's within each one of us. Absolutely. So he was not only an early adopter, he actually was a, he was a rebel against that paradigm of heaven had to be somewhere in the future, a pie in the sky, Superman God out there. He was speaking to the fact that the kingdom of heaven's at hand now, which is what Jesus taught, and that we could we could actually embrace that. So he was a rebel. He was um, stepped out of the matrix. And I imagine that he was uh, back in those days, he was an early adopter. So he's probably went under severe criticism for what he was teaching. You both can speak to that. I know. Yeah. Well, he, that's one of the things I loved is that remember, I'm bankrupt. I'm upside down. I've got no clothes and I'm going out to sell myself to the life insurance business. And here's this guy coming in 
elegantly, impeccably dressed each and every week and wowing everybody's spiritual inner being and saying, look, the presence of God in me blesses and cherishes, so to speak, the presence of God in, in you, and you can go out and do all these wonders. And then, you know, he got me to start really understanding tithing, and he'd have all of us stand up at the thing. Ultimately, <laughs> the tithing book we gave to everyone in your church one time, the miracle <laughs> tithing, where I say, you got to tithe your thinking, time, talent, treasures, and be thankful that you could do all that. But I watched people that came in one week, Michael, with nothing. Yeah. They were yeah. destitute. They were wearing rags. They looked like yeah. they needed a bath. And a week later, three weeks later, they would come in and they'd be elegantly attired. They got a brand new job, a brand new outlook. And what he did, like you started this whole meeting with us, is he, they changed their mindset. So they changed their money set, their life set, their future set. And they started to see that God in them could unveil and reveal everything good that they could possibly want. Because the thing that he'd quote most is, my cup runneth over, and the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he said, everybody in the South was saying, hey, we're living in poverty, we're living in want. And his own mother was beating on him saying, no, 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 you get your reward, like you said, in the, not in the sweet now, now, but in the far, far away. He said, no, no, I want my um, pie with ice cream on top, and I want it now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, he was called a maverick, nonconformist, unorthodox, unconventional, non-traditional, a kind of classic, which is basically a badge of breaking the paradigm. I mean, you can't, if you stay within the paradigm, nobody talks about you. But once you start slipping outside the paradigm and you come away from paradigm blindness, of which many people still live in today, you're talked about, you're criticized, you know. And, and I, Reverend, I mean, uh, yeah, you are a Reverend. <laughs> How did he handle that criticism? I know pretty much the answer, but I want to hear you talk about it. Sure. Yeah. So as I say, you know, his mandate was to defy, not comply with limited thinking, mm -hmm. um, to remit, not to submit to struggling and suffering as a culturally imposed lifestyle. So he mm -hmm. was bold mm -hmm. and um, brash and yes. buoyant. He was out there with it. Okay. So the criticism that he took, you know, people called him, they would call him a charlatan, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, a huckster. But these were people who were, you know, a lot of them were jealous, but also a lot of them did not hear what he was saying. And mm -hmm. they were focused on the bling and mm -hmm. not really the substance of what he was saying. Mm -hmm. My father chose to have a certain style to be an ostentatious example <laughs> of mm -hmm. what you could create. Let's yeah. see, for him, all of that, you know, whether it's cars, money, whatever, all of that is like silly putty. You can, it's, we know all this outer stuff is illusion and you can create and have as much of it as you want. So that's what part of what he was doing with demonstrating that. But how he would take the criticism is summed up in a statement he would frequently say, I am not other people's opinions. Mm -hmm. so it would roll off of him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. If yeah. I could add just one thing, Michael. Please, please, please. You know, because he and I became close friends. I went to church faithfully every Sunday if I was in New York and not working somewhere else. And it's so amazing. During that time, he was on every major show, whether it was Oprah. He was on Tom Snyder and drives in in his two-tone Rolls Royce. And they just couldn't believe it. They built a whole set for him. And he was on Phil Donahue's show. There was not a major show he didn't go on. And every one of them, Larry King, all of them tried to lambast him. And not only did he smile, but he handled it with a plum and, and articulate. He was a Bible scholar, but he was not a Bible scholar at a plebeian sidereal level. He was in the cosmic awareness of knowing what it meant and how to manifest, which is what Xavier's talking about. And I was with him at different times around the world traveling, and, and uh, he'd visualize getting a pair of blue shoes, for example, when he was in L.A., and he went in the store and he said, we don't have any shoes in size nine and blue. That doesn't exist. He said, no, it exists. It's here. And the guy had already been in the back of the store, goes in the back of the store and said, there they are. I right. don't know how you manifest this. One we, don't know, I, we don't know whether he created it or whether it was hidden there all the time, but it was it belonged to him by right of consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> Bingo. And, and the point that we're trying to share, Michael, is, and that's why we say it's a book of influence, because Solomon said, Psalm 72, be an influencer of influencers. And that's what he really did, not only for 20 million people here, but 20 million people in Africa. 
And and Xavier and I want to, we're on this tour selling this book (laughs) because we want everyone to not get one, but get two and go over everything in the book with somebody else. And if you're really well off and you want to help somebody else get well off, buy 10 and give them out to people that are in need. Because if they read it, they are going to, what him, uh, what, you know, Jesus said, did somebody touch him on my garment. They're going to get the energetic out of that and they're going to go straight up. And that's why the book is pre selling so well. Because he's, like you said a minute ago, Michael, he's got 28 million people watching him on YouTube. And, and truth is truth, no matter who says it. And he articulates it with such passionate purposefulness that it is irresistibly compelling. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing about it is he had millions of people back then and he still has millions of people today, you know, even though he's transition transitioned from the body temple, you know, that's a very, that's, that's powerful. That's a powerful testimony of something that pretty much lasts forever. You know, I had a chance to, to meet your dad as well. And, and, uh, and, and your mama, obviously. And um, I, I had the privilege of speaking at his memorial service there at the palace. That was that was quite an honor just to just to be a part of that that energy. And I can I can remember speaking there and the energy just was so mm, I could feel it moving through me, you know, and, and going back to what you were saying earlier, Xavier, is that um, in terms of healing, the body can heal anything if the condition is right, you know. And he had the capacity to create the vibrational condition and people's belief so the body could heal itself, you know? Mm-hmm. So he was um, extraordinary. Mm-hmm. Now, now, uh, w- what else, Mark, Xavier, you know, when you think about the book you just wrote, it's still new to you, what, what else do you, you want to bring forth to the public? That, that he was a great influencer, rebel, Paradigm Buster. Uh, there's so much maverick. Mm-hmm. I like that word because uh, Oprah used to call me a maverick all the time. She said, Michael's yeah. a spiritual maverick. You know, I took that as a compliment. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Well, well you know, my dad was a pioneer of new thought within the new thought movement. He took, he articulated a certain vibration of it that was yeah. uniquely his. Yeah. Um, and you talk about the timelessness of his teaching and his approach and how it touched millions then and touches millions now. That's what we're bringing in this book. We're bringing that vibration. And you mentioned that, you know, we were so honored to have you speak at the memorial. I was just looking at that Mm. before I came on. And one of the Mm. things you said, you asked the question, how can I give my life meaning based on Reverend Ike's passing? Mm. And the full awareness that he was a pioneer, the full awareness that he broke paradigms, the full awareness that he developed the mind psychology of spiritual self-esteem, with Mm. the full awareness that he allowed no one to live with excuses, Mm. with the full awareness that he was here not just to talk about his greatness, but allow you to know you're great. Mm -hmm. So in your words, that's what we're bringing with this book. We want everyone to know that this is this is also a success manual. When you read the book, oh, yeah. you will okay. see by example the steps that my father took. And if you apply the same methodology that's embedded in his life, the way he lived it, you can create as well in your unique way because you are great because you have God within. Mm-hmm. A success manual. Mark, mm-hmm. you were going to say something? Uh, there's so much to say. And and what happens is that his, one of his cliches was you can be what you want to be. You can do what you want to do and you can have what you want to have. And you've got to do that. And in the early days when I met him, I started, I wrote what I called my success journal. And one time he brings me back into his office, which, because you were in the palace, this guy had golden gilded everything at the Lowe's uh, to, I mean, you walked in there and it elevated your consciousness because it was regal. It was outstanding. It was uh, it was sculpturally wonderful because the guy had him he and his wife, Mrs. Eichron Coder, had impeccable taste. And and what you said about the whole energetic of the place, it, it lifted people from their back to what you said, Michael, about the condition. He says, you don't let your condition, you don't let your situation, you don't let your circumstances control you. You take controls from the inside and bring it to the outside because what you impress, you're going to express. 
and and you can facilitate manifesting. Everyone has infinitely more talents than they're using. And what he brought us to awareness of is here's your, all your talents. Just pick one and bring it to peak performance and you will have all the money you want. You have the love you want, the friendship you want, the joy you want, happiness, all of which he you know, preached, taught, and exampled. And then he brought in the testimonials of everybody who also had a ear church from you name it. Ben Vereen was there and, and I got to befriend all those people because a lot of times he let me do this stage meditations like you've let me talk at your church on, on repetitive right. times. Right. And we we had a ball and um, touched by an angel star. Yeah, uh, right. yeah Della, Della sang and just her voice woke up everybody's soul. I mean, there's, you know, it, it just, it, it was so exciting for me to go. I mean, I never met, and the next day I would go out and do more business than ever just because he literally elevated the spirit and would, Xavier and I are saying, look, this book is a compendium and, and a manual of what he's got. If you touch it, you read it, even one page a day, it's going to elevate, escalate, and have you uh, do things you didn't know you could do. And, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. We're looking forward to meeting you when we're on the road um, doing seminars on this and, and workshops. It just it, It's the most extraordinary time in history if you're awake, alive, and enthusiastic, which obviously this book's going to help everyone become more of. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, t two things. One, in the palace, you were, you're absolutely correct about the energy there. I mean, before it was popular, he had big crystals there, you know, gigantic crystals. And then he had uh, things from Egypt. I mean, he was bringing in all manner of the ageless teachings curated from different parts of the world. It was all in the sanctuary. You know, you couldn't you couldn't walk to the sanctuary without being impacted visually and energetically by what was around. I, I remember just walking through there and it was like, wow, I mean, this is this is a gigantic. This is before that stuff was popular. You know what I mean? Everybody knows about crystals now. They know about certain things from Egypt at this particular time in human history. But back then he was definitely a rebel. He was definitely just bringing it home. And, <laughs> and it's powerful. Now, and you can speak to that also, Xavier. Also, the book itself, it, 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 you guys wrote it, but it also carries actually his words as well, right? Yes, it does, indeed. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, over the years, he would tell parts of his story. You know, he had scribes and what have you. And um, he wanted to get an autobiography out there, but he never, you know, brought it to completion. So we were able to you know, thankfully have some of his exact words within the story, which is uh, mm. very, very important. Mm. And the storytelling is just, just wonderful. I mean, you hear things about my dad in this book that you never will have never heard before. Mm. You'll okay. come to understand things that no one else knew. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of fun revelation and there's some funny stories and um, heartwarming stories and you really see how, for example, giving is at the heart of the man. And that one of the major things that drove him to give this message so passionately was this spirit of giving. Yeah. And um, you talk about his being steeped in the ancient teachings, you know, um, so many. there. You've got theosophy, you've got the Egyptian um, mysteries, you have all kinds of a scene uh, mysteries mm. that he studied. I mean, all of that was in there, but he was able to articulate it in a way that was so very unique. Mm -hmm. And when you read the progression of his life story, you can see the spiritual initiations that happen mm. and see the awakenings step by step. Mm. You can see how he applied spiritual uh, teachings. And as you say, you know, ancient wisdom modern uh, knowledge mm -hmm. and and one of the things that he brought home as any true teacher does is that we can all be soulful revolutionaries we can all be great we can all be access our potential as you said uh, earlier mark you know he wasn't talking about himself uh, other than being an example he was basically talking about the giftedness and the luminosity of every soul that he had an opportunity to touch so that's that's the mark of a real teacher yeah mm -hmm. Right. And, and back to what Jesus did is Jesus said, first of all, you transform yourself, right? 
Paul, that which I quote it all the time, be transformed by the self-renewing of your mind, right? He transformed himself. Then he got others to transform, and then he got a whole coterie of ministers, both here in America and in Africa. And then he'd fill every coliseum, like regularly, Madison Square Garden, Shrine Auditorium, mm-hmm. uh, San Francisco. But he it was always sold out it was in Atlanta, Georgia, and on and on. And it was packed out. And and just, you go, wow. And the guy did it. And he brought everybody in that was anybody at the time. When we were at Madison Square Garden, he brought in Muhammad Ali as, as one of his guys. Now, that's a Muslim but because he wasn't locked in, he knew that there's one God, one source, one universe, and, and he would come from the inside out on that and get everybody to wake up to God in them. And he didn't really care what he, they called God. Right. And then, uh, what, Xavier, the fact yeah. that he was ahead of his game in terms of buying property. Uh-huh. I mean, that's pretty deep. Mm. You guys still own, had, had that property, right? Mm. Well, yeah, he to a degree, yeah, to a degree, yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. See, the thing about my dad was being born in the Jim Crow South, yeah, and rebelling against the poverty, right? Uh, rebelling against crushing religious dictates coming even from his own mother, mm-hmm. that told black people that we they were there to suffer, mm. um, rebelling against all of that, and understanding again that I am a child of God. I deserve all the good that God has. Mm -hmm. And developing his mind power, as you would call it, and the self-image psychology that the oneness of God uh, gives you, he was able to create wealth. Mm -hmm. And part of that wealth certainly was to be a property owner. Mm -hmm. Um, Matter of fact, his father was an amazing man who was, by the standards of that day, a very prosperous man. But unfortunately, when he and uh, my grandmother separated, he left my mom and and, uh, my dad and his mother in poverty. Mm. So that also is some of what gave my dad tremendous drive. Okay. My grandfather was a property owner. I actually still have some of that property in, in South Carolina. And so my dad, as a part of his expression of freedom, decided that he would fully enjoy an abundant life. You know, I've come that you might have life in that more abundantly. He took Christ literally at that Mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, whether it's property, physical things like that, that he developed, you know, in various places across the country. um, Yeah, he, he was proud of that. And it was important to see a black man yeah. um, succeed to that level because he gave so many black people hope that yes. you could be and do and have right. all that you desire because God, in fact, wants it for you. And, you know, there is that whole uh, side of it as well. You know, my dad is part of the uh, the black experience, which is really important that we delve into uh, in the book as well. Mm-hmm. Cause I know he said, you know, I, I don't mind black power, but we got to have some green power too. You yes. know, <laughs> as people, exactly. we have to know how to curate some prosperity, you know, as we're coming into black power and a greater self image. We also have to know about what prosperity is and how to lift ourselves to be able to embody and ultimately manifest that. And, <clears throat> and that's why he was under criticism at times because he said, Hey, you know, I, I, I like to say sometimes, you know, if you, you can't be the light of the world, if you can't pay your light bill, you know, <laughs> and uh, so so he was basically encouraging people to, as you we've talked about, get out of the victim mentality, the oppressed mentality. Yes, bad things have happened. Things that were out of our control, they did happen. We don't deny that. However, that does not have to be your destiny. You can change your destiny. If you get into the right heart and mind set. Yes. And 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 uh, this is what he did. That so, limitation is not who you are. It's right. not who you are. Right. So, right. So, so go ahead, Mark. He taught if you had white hot burning desire and a directional compass to where it is you wanted to go, you'd fulfill a new higher destiny. And when you got there, you'd get to go to a higher destiny because the game isn't over until you transition. And then the game isn't over either because you get to live forever. Spirit lives forever. Absolutely. So we're always on the verge and on the edge of greater discovery of our real self. 
and then the greater capacity to to share that, to glow with that, to radiate that, to to contribute to the world. So basically, he was saying in substance, we didn't come here necessarily to get. We came here to let. We came here to to contribute. And if you're living, because you used the word giving earlier, Xavier, because if you're living to give, as as Kahil Gibran reminds us, the hands of the givers are never empty. You know, if you're if you're living to contribute from the depth of your being, your hands are full by the law of the universe because you're not living from lack and, and victimization, you're living from I have a lot to contribute, I have yes. a lot to give. That takes you out of victim consciousness. Absolutely. And the way my dad would articulate that, he says that when you're really giving, first of all, you're creating abundant life, not just for yourself. Yes, right. for yourself, for your friends, family, community, everybody you love, but also for the world. And so you can ex inspire people. And so by giving, he said you were entering into a never ending cycle of increase and enjoyment, which is, I mean, there's no lack in that, you know, there's no lack whatsoever. And I like to say that he really, he defined there is no lack in black. <laughs> yeah. I like that. <laughs> he helped so many black people step out of that uh, limited mentality, not to identify with. And, and he took criticism, for example. He was invited to the Poor People's March, even though he did march in King, King rallies and he, he talked with Malcolm X and he's met with, you know, Elijah Muhammad, et cetera. So he would not identify with the, quote, unquote, termino the, the terminology of the quote unquote, poor people's march, because right. he didn't agree with black people identifying themselves as poor people. Yes. He appreciated the value of the work, but certain nomenclature he would not buy into. Right. It's like Mother Teresa not wanting to go to an anti-war rally. She mm -hmm. would rather go to a peace rally, a love rally, but she, she didn't want to identify with war or anti anything. So it's, it's a similar... Uh, being conscious of the words that come out of your mouth and conscious of the description of your life so that whatever comes out of your mouth, you'll experience at some point. Yes. So, yeah, I appreciate that. Yes. And on giving, there are some wonderful, you'll read wonderful counts in, in the book. One of the great things I love about the book is that we have a number of people who tell their story about mm -hmm. how they were impacted by Reverend Ike and how his giving to them in their lives uh, changed their lives for the good. Even just, for example, with education, he sponsored so many people through education. I mean, we're talking K through PhD. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. There, there's, we don't know how many people he actually supported, but droves and droves of people. Right. I have a friend of mine, I haven't seen him in years, but he had a nice Volkswagen. He was driving down the street here in Los Angeles. And Reverend Knight pulls up alongside of him in his roles and looks at him and says, nice car, and drives on. He said he didn't know how to take that, <laughs> but it motivated him to expand his awareness. And he ended up getting into a Mercedes. Then he ended up, you know, getting property. It like <laughs> Reverend Knight just said, all he said was, nice car. He didn't demean it. He didn't put it down. He just said, nice car. <laughs> when it, it did something to the man, and it, it just like, Nice car. What did he mean by nice car? He's driving a Rolls Royce. That's great. Uh, and it just uh, changed. It changed his whole life. <laughs> well, that's like when Reverend Ike was in the Mysterio School in New York City. Which, by the way, I got to just do real quick. He he didn't get the scholarship he wants. Across the street was a jute joint, which is a, a classy term for something a little less classy. Right. And, <laughs> uh, he's he's not doing well and doesn't have any money, and he's a kid, so he goes in there and he's sort of crying in his beer, so to speak, but he wasn't drinking. And a, a girl of ill repute, a woman says, well, what's wrong? Said, I want to go to ministerial school and I just didn't get the scholarship. So she says, well, what does it cost? And she goes into her bra, pulls out cash. I get goosebumps. <laughs> this is a chicken soup story. Because how do you get a woman that's running, uh, a, right. a, a, paying for your school in ministerial school, but the, the, and and that's what you know. The Apostle Paul said, "The ways God's ways are past finding out." I mean, he was meant to be one of the great evangelists, one of the great right. leaders of all times. That right. was a visionary leader that could take us in a new, bigger, better direction. And all Xavier and I are saying is, "Look, everyone is wherever they are is great, like the Volkswagen, 
but they've got something better inside and you've got to read the book to catch on what your better is because the better it gets, the better it gets. And there's no limit to what better it could be. Absolutely. <laughs> you guys are bringing down a whole lot of information about Reverend Ike. Let's, we're going to come back to that, but I want to ask you, Mark, you know, you dropped a book last year, Relentless Wisdom Behind the Incomparable Chicken Soup for the Soul. And then you have the book, Ask. Briefly, give us a little bit of that, too, because people can still get those books, too, right? Yeah. Relentless is amazing because this woman is is in Egypt, just where you were, and, and with music made the whole yeah. pyramids vibrate. Her name is very famous. Purdue Chicken. Frank Purdue started that. That was her husband. Her mm -hmm. father was a guy who, during the Depression, uh, started a little hotel chain, you know, called Sheridan Inn and built 400 hotels during the <laughs> little tiny little thing there. <laughs> little tiny thing. This is Mitzi Purdue. She's <laughs> in Egypt, and only because you guys have both brought all three of us have brought her up. Uh, she's with my good friend Brad Rotter, a superstar from West Point, and says, Hey, um, you got to meet my best friend. Said, Look, I'm intimidated to meet the world's best selling author, Mark Victor Hansen. So she gets together, she says, Look, I write all biographies, let me write your biography. I said, have at it. I, I, you know, only one in a hundred million get a biography. That's why Xavier and I are so happy to do this according to Google. Anyhow, she wrote that it, it won 10 major awards last year, relentless. Mm. And mm. it just, it, it really tells my life story coming out of Danish immigrant parents that had absolutely nothing. I had to work for my own clothes since I was nine to, to uh, now changing the world, not only in the book business, but, and we're changing it again in a couple of different ways. And then I own two energy companies, one of which will do a trillion dollars because we're taking all the garbage. Uh, we're doing his book, uh, Dean Rose. Uh, Dean Rose is the equivalent of Elon Musk in the garbage business. Right. And all garbage, taking trash to cash, making metal to metal, glass to glass, plastic, plastic, water. we got plenty of energy. What Ike always taught is there's no limitation except right. mental limitation, right? I mean, those aren't his exact words, but that's the... I'm uh, uh, expressing what he'd said and believed, and that's what we're doing. And then the other book, Ask, we're saying, God, there's only three tunnels to ask. My wife and I wrote it, and and you were going to marry us, and then we couldn't get you in a jet to Sedona fast enough, as you may remember. <laughs> but you got to ask. Right. <laughs> well, it's not that we don't love you, Michael. It's that we just couldn't get you there. And right, you know, right. all hundreds and hundreds of people. You got to ask yourself, ask others, ask God. It's mm -hmm. that simple. And those are the only three channels for asking mm -hmm. but if you ask not you receive not right so, so asking makes you available uh and open to receive whereas you don't ask you don't even know the miracles that are waiting for you if you just ask yeah absolutely. and most of them don't ask themselves for enough like that first book i wrote which sunshine diary became a, a mega bestseller called future diary and Reverend Ike, I brought it to him. He said, holy cow, I've never seen anyone with stacks of asking because I, I write everything I want every day into that kind of a book. And, and I've got 50 years of journals sitting here. Mm -hmm. You know, I really believe the principles because the way Ike would teach it is he took the line out of Hubbuck. I'm pronouncing it wrong, Hubbuck. Anyhow, and it says, write a thing, make it clear, it shall be established onto you. And Ike would say, that's biblical certainty. Right. So you write it down, it's yours, and all you do is synchronize with it. But you got to ask yourself, what do I really want in my heart of hearts, my soul? Yes, 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 absolutely. I mean, I write that down, and I read it as I'm going to sleep at night. And then the first thing I read in the morning is that, that I had written down as well. So I, I'm in the hypnagogic state, goes right into the subconscious before I get totally awake or as I'm falling asleep. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Remember what you used to say, we used to say years ago, think it and ink it. <laughs> That's right. And that, by the way, that's why Crystal and I, you know, I'm 75, but I'm going to live the 127 options for renewal. We're living the most extraordinary life possible. And look at the friends we got. I got Xavier as a co-author, and I got you as a lifelong friend. Yeah. Can't get rid of me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's beautiful, man. I'm glad, we're, I'm glad we're together on this journey. And yeah. uh, Xavier, what are you up to these days? What's your next, what are you, what are you looking to, uh, to be about in terms of your next project? What do you, you know, I know you, you, you hit that drum, you work with the youth. You do. You've been doing a lot of stuff. What's what's new for you next? Yes. Well, well, absolutely. And, and if, apologies. I just want to correct you on one thing. I'm not a master drummer. <laughs> but you do play the drums. You do. I, hit, do, I you do, do hit. play the drum. I'm a student of the of West African drummer, but a master drummer is is something beyond me. <laughs> I learn from master drummers. I understand. But I did hear you play, and you were pretty good. 
I appreciate that. I so appreciate it, but I just want to distinguish because right. there, you know, there's some. Um, I understand. Yes, but, uh, you know, drumming is definitely one of my passions. And um, I have an outlet called Xavier Soul Streams, mm. which is the way that I'm getting my personal work and personal message out there. And it is mm -hmm. music, messages, and meditation. So mm -hmm. the music is it's original music that I write and produce with my uh, my creative partner. And we do videos. All of the, that is available there on, on Soul Streams. And um, I also do inspirational spoken word. Mm -hmm. And we score that mm -hmm. again, wonderful music, and we create videos, inspirational videos to it. So you can watch the video, be inspired by the word, but also have the visual journey to go through. And then I also do, we create guided meditations. Mm -hmm. So I'll take the certain material from the song, thread it through the inspirational um, pieces, and then do guided meditation so that we can have, as you know, it's important to do an embodied experience in an altered state yeah. where you can suffuse your vibration with all of the positive, you know, messages and, and the visions that you have and the desires that you have on your heart yeah. so that you can inculcate them into your subconscious and un unconscious and really harness that power and manifest the good that you want. And then... That's Xavier Soul Streams. But then of That's course, how they can find that. They go to Xavier Soul Streams. Dot com. Yes. Dot com. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And of course, Rev Ike Legacy is uh, Reverend Ike. Rev Ike Legacy dot com is an ongoing project. We've been working hard on that. My wife and Annette and I um, just constantly renewing it. And our team is doing such an excellent job of continuing to present the material. You know, what my dad has accomplished. We have decades and decades, so much audio and video content. We will be rolling these out for uh, more decades to come. But I'm really excited about uh, about things we're doing. We're also um, recently there's there's, you know, it's the first time I'm saying this. There's a rap uh, song that some of Snoop's um, <laughs> posse have produced, which I'm very excited about. We're going to be really starting to push the edge and, and do some fun things uh, with Rev Ike legacy material that a lot of the, the younger generation are going to be uh, excited about. So yeah, you, revikelegacy.com. You're going to meet them where they are. Exactly. The young folks don't want to get caught up in religiosity. They're leaving the regular church in droves. They want, to, they want the message we have and yes. the feeling and the music and the sense of community. They don't want a piety. Nope. And uh, God in the sky, they went a full on realization of their oneness with the presence, the, yep. the, the metaphysical power, the mysticism. And so, you know, we, we, we see at Agape now so many young people coming in there and just like, oh, my God, this is a breath of fresh air. Oh, my God. You know, my mother's mad because I'm not going to her church, but hey, I got to be here. You know, so I understand what you're saying. Very, very yes. It's the authenticity that they resonate to with you and Agape. You know, of course, I've been Agape many times. Yes. And that's the thing. They don't want to be preached at anymore. Yeah. They want to be lifted and inspired. They want to, you know, be encouraged to bring out their gifts and create the world that they want, that they have envisioned within their hearts and minds. Yeah, absolutely. Any way we can support them uh, to do that, that's what we're here for. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Brother Mark, where can people find you? And what's what's I know the latest thing is the book. And what's the title of, of Reverend of the book? It's Reverend Ike, an extraordinary man of influence. We're excited and we will tour and you know, somewhere down the line, hopefully you'll invite us to your church and we'll get to do a little talk on a Sunday afternoon or whatever that's you know convenient for you on a Wednesday night. You used to let me take over some of your services on a Yeah, I did. <laughs> it was fun. It was great. By the way, I had nothing but fun. I just, first of all, I want to go back and compliment you like about what you said about Xavier's drumming. Bob Proctor and I went to see him when he had a home in Malibu and he had the giant drum as big as my office wall, which is probably 12. And, and we got to play it with him. And it just, it does move the essence of the spiritual soul because all life is vibration. I mean, you've taught that forever. And, and Reverend Ike got everybody into an escalating, elevating uh, vibration so they yes. could expand spiritually with a brand new model of who they could become. That is the critical teaching in this book. Absolutely. The big, great influencer. Mm. Oh my God. 
Any any last comments on anything, something you might say to yourself, oh, I wish I would have said this about him or about the teaching or about whatever you're up to? Mark, any, anything left? Well, first of all, you know I've got a lifelong love with books because I came out of being illiterate and, you know, my parents couldn't speak English and I was in the dumb class to sixth grade and, and remedial reading with a nice, beautiful, white-haired fairy, but said, Hanson's in dumb class and I'm world's best-selling author. But I don't <laughs> think, I honest to God, don't think Chicken Soup as a series, which I did with Jack, who you know very well, Dr. Canfield, is would have happened if I hadn't been exposed to Reverend Ike, where I went in there and I was despondent, disconsolate, uh, downtrodden, and all of a sudden this guy just woke up my soul and my spirit again and said, hey, wait a second, you can come alive. And it's never, it's never gone back to sleep. And what we're saying is this book is so terrific it's going to wake you up. That is my personal promise. If you buy it, and for whatever reason you do read it and it doesn't, you send it back to me. I'll personally send you the money back. That's how much I guarantee, you know, Reverend Ike's book that Xavier and I have written. Dropping this December. You can pre-order it right now. Xavier, any, any final comments? Let me refer back to your words again at my dad's memorial, your wonderful words. We're celebrating primarily because there's something about Reverend Ike that will never die. Mm. that he being the spiritual image and the very likeness of God itself mm. born out of divine substance of ultimate reality continues to grow, develop and unfold to reveal more life, more love, more joy, more beauty and harmony than we could possibly imagine. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's all about. It's all about this book and, you know, my dad as a embodiment of what he taught inspiring us all to awaken to possibility to a world to a future that we can live that is beyond the best that we can imagine mm -hmm. xavier brother mark thank you for being my guest on take back your mind which obviously that particular title is about having dominion over our own attention and not allowing what people think about us what the world what's going on in the world to determine our destiny we take back our mind as Reverend Ike so eloquently described so that we can live the life of our unique expression of infinite good. And so uh, you did send me, uh, I think, as a pre-copy of the book. Yes, sir. I, I started going through it, and uh, it is very inspirational, and it just took me into, uh, it took me into the past, but then it jettisoned me right back to this moment to use these principles in a very, very powerful way as I as I do on a regular basis. So thank you guys for getting together. Xavier, you called Mark and said, let's do this. Is that what happened? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, Mark is uh, obviously <laughs> in the Guinness Book of World Records for how many books on the bestseller list at one time? <laughs> Right, right, right. Nobody's got more than me. Total 59, number one. And at, at one time on USA Today, we had 15 to the top 50. And and uh, we're video you know, taping with a lady who is Oprah's uh, uh, lady. I, I'm blanking on her name. The uh, cat bird uh, sings. Uh, what is her name, Michael? I'm blanking on it. Um, the greatest poet. You're talking about Maya Angelou? Yeah, Maya Angelou. Uh -huh. And Maya Angelou, we're filming with her. Jack and I are filming with her right in Santa Monica. And she says, you guys are hogging the list. I said, you can outsell us. You just got to market as well as I do. I'm the I, <laughs> Forgive me for being self-aggrandizing here, but I am the best marketer that exists in books on the planet. And because I do bypass marketing and we're, that's exactly where Xavier and I are going with this. We're going to bypass market this and get it in everyone's hands that wants to elevate, escalate, improve, uplift, and fulfill their destiny. Outstanding. So that was one obvious reason why I asked Mark. But the other one that's more, you know, even important to me at a heart level is, you know, he was mentored by my dad and he attributes so much of his, his success to my dad. And he has a love for my dad. And my dad had a great love for him. So he mm -hmm. called him his Viking son. <laughs> 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 and so I thought, well, you know, who better to 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 ask to to help, uh, you know, hit the hit clean up with this project and really uh, get it out to the world. And we well, love it. I'm glad you did, Xavier. I'm glad you reached out to him. I'm glad you weren't going to allow, not going to allow this um, this transformational knowledge to come forth as it has been expressing through your dad. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
for for bringing that forward. Yeah, the good pleasure. It changed a lot of lives. Absolutely, and thank you so very much, Reverend Michael. Absolutely. Well, everyone, this is Brother Mark. I can I can call them by their first name because you know, we're, we're we're pals. Brother Mark, Brother Xavier. Thank you guys for being with me. Wonderful blessings to all. Thank you for having us on, Michael. Absolutely. My joy. This is our portion of practicing the art and the science of meditation. True meditation is paying undistractable attention to that which is real. Capital R, real. We all curate uh, our level of experience of reality which may or not, may not be reality, it's just our experience of it. In other words, most people don't experience reality. They experience their thoughts about reality. So if you have a, a negative self-image, if you have uh, a, a subjective tendency towards scarcity or lack, then you'll create a, a reality of which you'll experience lack and limitation. It's, it's not reality, it's just your experience of reality. So meditation allows us to open ourselves up, to have an insight to that which is real, that which is eternal, that which is forever, that which is everywhere in its fullness. So we're gonna take just a couple of moments. You remember, this is just a brief meditation, and I'm encouraging you to establish a meditation practice on a daily basis, because sincerity and earnestness and consistency really yields great results in terms of your mind no longer vacillating in the world of effects. You become more and more in tune with that which is real and you become a candidate for insight into reality, capital R, reality. I say that because it has become popular for people to say, well, that's just my truth. That's just my truth. That actually means that's just my opinion. That's just my experience. But it doesn't mean that's the truth. And so we want to um, separate people saying, you know, that's my truth to the truth. So when you hear, um, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's the truth of your being. When you know the truth of your being, spiritual liberation follows. Let's close the outer eye. <clears throat> hands on her lap. Just have it face downward this time as a sign of not ascending and going to heaven, but as a sign of bringing heaven to earth. So we establish an intention to wake up to our glorious nature. After a while, your intention develops a feeling tone that every time you sit, you can actually feel your intention. Many of you have been sitting weekly in the meditation practice and you're starting to develop a feeling tone for it. So your attention is embracing the feeling tone of your intention. And you're becoming aware of pure listening. Not just with your ears, but your entire being is available to hear the still small voice, the sacred call of your soul, and the awareness that this is your very first time practicing. Whether you are a beginner or a veteran, we always go to beginner's mind, this is the first time. And here we sit.
you've heard the statement, be still and know that I am God in the midst of you. moment of silent brevity, full intentionality, we give thanks. We give thanks. We give thanks. In this consciousness of gratitude and thanksgiving, we allow the spiritual God times to roll in our life. That would be peace and love and harmony and wholeness, abundance and harmonizing prosperity, well-being. We allow it to flow through and as us now. And we let it be so. And so it is. Amen. As we open our eyes, we just say to each other, all the people all around the globe tuning in right now, we just say to each other, now so be it. Be that frequency, be that vibration. And so it is. Thank you for your support. Many of you are donating to the sponsor, Agape International Spiritual Center, by going to the agapelive.com, the website, putting in there, thank you for the podcast. Thank you very much. Many of you are taking care of your own health by going to neutralize.com and getting the bundle of Adaptazen, the 47 plant-based ingredients with adaptogens, rhodiola, and maca, and ashwagandha, pro probiotics, prebiotics, digestive enzymes, all in one green scoop that tastes so good, along with your vitamin D3, K2, and a bit of MCT oil and olive oil, great bioavailability. Those are our sponsors right now. Please support while you're supporting yourself. Have a beautiful day. Your time is very valuable, so I want to thank you for lending us your ear and participating in taking back your mind. If you want to submit a question for the question of the week, please submit it to podcast at michaelbeckwith.com. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, please submit a review and let us know your thoughts. Stay on top of current episodes by subscribing to the podcast so that you'll receive alerts and not miss one single episode. And feel free to share this podcast with all of your friends and family. And until we meet again, take back your mind and you will take back your life. Peace and blessings.